Follow me. Good evening. Thank you for the two friendly people. Good evening. Um, I'm, I, I just want to say the first thing that God did was hospitality. Um, he did it for us, so let's, let's be nice. Um, but we, we're busy with this series, Following Jesus, and I'll, I'll refer to that a little bit later. Um, but we all know the stories of, uh, you know, before crucifixion. We, we all know the story of how Jesus got to the crucifixion. And we all kind of know the story of crucifixion. But it's, it's really the, the next 40 days uh, after the resurrection of Jesus and before his ascension, the 40 days that we find ourselves in tonight, that really fascinates me. Because it, it, it feels like there are 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension stories that we just don't know. Like we all know the stories before the crucifixion and there is so little knowledge that we have when it comes to the stories after the, the, the resurrection. And it, it really fascinates me. And that's kind of where I want to focus on tonight and where we are going tonight. But there is this whole concept about the number 40. There is this symbolic symbolism almost uh, connotated to, to the number 40. And you, you find it everywhere in the Bible. And I, th I th think you can uh, think of a few examples when it comes to the number 40. Like God made it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. After Moses killed the Egyptian, that happened, if you didn't know. After Moses killed the Egyptian, he spent 40 years in the desert tending livestock. Moses was in Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites wandered for 40 years before they entered the promised land. Before Samson's liberation, uh, Israel served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath uh, defied Saul's army for 40 days before David arrived to kill him and obviously the, the obvious, too, is Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights under temptation in the desert. And there are 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and the ascension. So th there, there are a lot of instances of the number 40 when it comes to the word. But if you really look closely within these different stories, there is always this in-between period, this in-between time, this in-between phase they find themselves in. Like, for instance, they, they are in a certain place, then there is this in-between time period of 40 days or 40 years, and then something big happens. But what's interesting, in, in most of these stories, in those in-between time, in those 40 days or 40 years, it is not a waiting period. It is almost this active spiritual awakening phase in between time. For, for instance, if we look at Jesus' story, I promise you he didn't enter the desert and just hung out there until he felt now's the time is good and, you know, waiting for it all to be over so that he can continue. If you really look at what the Word is saying, when it comes to those four, first 40 days of Jesus entering the desert, it was necessary so that he can be released for his ministry. What's also interesting is the last 40 days, the 40 days that we find ourselves in now, the 40 days between this resurrection and his ascension was necessary so that you and I can be released for our ministry. Matthew 28, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. That is what happens in this 40 days. It's important for me and for you to actually know these specific stories when it comes to what happened between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. So my question kind of tonight is, do you find yourself in this in-between phase right now? Do you find yourself in the place where you feel that you are in 40 days or even 40 years um, for, for some of you when it comes to your situation? But my question is, whatever is going on in your life right now, are you just waiting for day 41 or year 41? Are you just waiting for this massive thing to happen? Or are you actually active spiritually preparing for what God is busy doing and what is coming 
next. It's easy to say, I'm doing it. But when life hits, when the struggles hit, when the, the situations hit, it's easy to wait for it to be over and just hope that someday it will actually be better. But there is this symbolism behind the, the, the 40 number, or the number 40, however you want to read that. But what's interesting is when you look at the, uh, the, the number 40 in the word and you translate it to Greek, it's very, very interesting. If you translate it to the number 40 to Greek, and even if you translate the number 40 to Hebrew, even if you translate it to Elvish, whatever the case may be, it's still 40. <laughs> Thanks. What I mean by this is 40, is, 40 days is a, is a long time. 40 days is a long time, and it takes a while. It's more than a month. It, it is a long time unless you're matric, and it's 40 days before your final exam starts. That's the only time 40 days is quite fast. But 40 days is a long time for Jesus to be part of stories that you and I need to be aware about. 40 days, Jesus can do a lot. And that is what we're focusing in this series of following Jesus in today's world to just to amplify and emphasize this kind of, because when we look at the different stories that happens in this 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, it is important because those are kind of the last commandments that Jesus made before he went to heaven. In those 40 days, he taught a lot about what kingdom looks like. The, he was giving the, the, the questions and invitations, follow me, but also urges us to go forth and spread the good news. Those last 40 days are very important for me and you because it is the result of that, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that releases me and you to be able to follow him, to be able to spread the good news and to be able to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. But what's interesting is that in these 40 days, the stories when it, revolving around these 40 days is filled with stories of people, friends, and disciples of Jesus that didn't even recognize him. And that is also relevant for us when it comes to this specific series because following Jesus in today's world, it is so easy to, to, to be bombarded and, and surrounded by situations and conditions or problems, whatever the case might be, which causes us to have difficulty to recognize Jesus in those specific situations that we find ourselves in. John 20, verse 13 to 16, read the following, But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, Jesus knelt to look into, she knelt to look into the womb, tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of G where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and they, I don't know where they put him. Some translations talk about, I don't know where they buried my master. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Can we just pause for a moment there and talk about Jesus' facial expression? Just, just think about it. Like, this is the, the main event. This is the, the big thing that, uh, that he, he and God planned out, the, the big reveal of who he is and what is coming. And he's kind of standing there outside the tomb like, like, what, 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 what do you think? Like, amazing, right? And she didn't even recognize him. Like, I feel reluctant to say this, but can you imagine, like, Jesus just rolling his eyes just for a moment? before he actually replied Mary. Like, just, just think about what actually happened in Mary's life, where she came from being possessed with demons to actually meeting Jesus. Her whole life changed, and in a moment, she didn't even recognize Jesus. But the story goes further. Jesus spoke to her, woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can take care of him. Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabbani, meaning teacher. But can you imagine for a moment, like all those time spent with Jesus and Jesus standing literally in front of her and she didn't even recognize her 
recognize him because she was so focused on the specific, specific thing that she wants. And oftentimes it happens to us and it looks like this. This is the, the vision that we have. We, we are so trying to focus on different situations in our life. We're trying to, to resolve situations or to, to lessen the stress and anxiety and, you know, fight depression and fight addiction, whatever my case might be. And everything just becomes so blurry that the more you focus on one thing, the more out of focus other things come, become. And that also happens in our life when it comes to Jesus. When we keep our eyes focused on what is going on in our lives, the, when we keep our f- eyes focused on the financial situations, the, the, the plans for our future and the being able to work or not being able to work, having work, not having a work, going to study is still exams, whatever the case might be, the more we focus on that, the more distorted our picture becomes of God. And even though He's always standing right in front of us, in the moment. He's not just standing in front of us. He's in that moment with us. There's this amazing story, um, like uh, AJ and Daniel, that, that we're here. Um, he told it a few years ago. Um, he, he planned this in, uh, surprise for his wife, Danielle, um, saying that uh, he, he, he surprised her with a visit from her mom, but obviously she didn't know about it. And he said that he, she should go to the train station to go pick her up, but he obviously didn't say she's, she's going to pick her up um, because that is the surprise. He told her, there is this pastor coming, and I'm quite busy. I can't go and fetch him. Can you go and fetch this pastor at the train station? Obviously, she's so happy about that. She, she's so reluctant, like, I'm, I'm this girl, and I have to go to this train station. I have to pick up a random person, a random pastor that I have no idea who it is. And she's arriving on this train station platform, and she's just looking for this pastor that she doesn't even know exists or what he looks like. And there's just a sea of people, and her mother is standing right in front of her. But because she's looking for this other person, she looks at her mom and just goes, Phew, looking at other people. Oftentimes, it is right in front of us. It is always, He is always right in front of us. But when we focus on what is going on around us, the problem always becomes bigger than the situation we are in. So my question for you tonight is, is there something preventing you from seeing God? Is there a situation going on in your life right now where you are so focused on trying to figure that out that you completely miss what God wants to do in that moment? That you completely not recognize God in that specific situation? What stops you from seeing God? We finished Easter, we, we celebrated uh, what, what Jesus did for us on, in, during crucifixion, Good Friday. We celebrated uh, Resurrection Sunday, but the question is, what now? Where, where, what, what do we do now? Where is God right now? When we talk about not being able to see God, not being able to recognize God, there are quite a few paradoxes in the Bible, especially when we read John 20, 29. It is uh, Jesus talking to, to uh, Thomas. He said, so you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. It's quite confusing, right? Like uh, there, is, there is these paradoxes between uh, believing and seeing and not believing and not seeing. Um, like they say, if you see and not believe, then Jesus asks you questions. Believe but not see, then you are blessed. It, it, it doesn't make sense. There are these paradoxes between seeing and believing. But my question might be is, is when it comes to the situation in your life that you are facing now that's taking all the airtime in your mind, that's taking all the, 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 the space in your worries and your anxiety, whatever the case might be, um, do you believe? Even if you do not see? Imagine what the life would look like if we see God, because let's, let's, let's proclaim, we, we've seen what God can do, right? What can happen in our lives when we can see God, but also believe in Him? There's this quote I read a long time ago, it's important to believe in God, but it's also important to believe God as well. When it comes to the specific situations in our lives. Do you see Mary in yourself? 
Is there something in your life right now that you're trying to figure out, that you're trying to, 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 to resolve or trying to focus on, that you completely not recognize Jesus in that specific moment? The problem Christians, many Christians uh, are stuck at is the following. They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they buried him. Even though Jesus was standing right in front of her, she still had this belief that he is not alive. So the question might be tonight, is Jesus still buried in your childhood wounds? Is Jesus still buried in the amount of control that you want to have in situations in your life? Is Jesus still buried in your addictions? Is Jesus still buried in your marriage? Is he still buried in your work? Is he still buried in your studies? Is he still buried in your finances? Is he still buried in your relationships? Is Jesus still buried in the plans that you have for your future? We have this belief that we have been, been crucified with Jesus. We, like, the old is gone and all these uh, fleshly worries is, is dead. It is crucified with Jesus and we have been resurrected with him. We have been resurrected through him by the Spirit and therefore we can trust in him. We can look onto him because he is alive. But still, we focus on these things in our lives and we're not able to recognize Jesus in it. Galatians 2 verse 20, I want to read it to you. I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah who lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith. This is the whole concept of, of believing even though we don't necessarily see him. By adherence to and reliance and and, on, and complete, by adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in. Can you look at this list and what is relevant to you? I guess you can honestly say you have complete trust in Jesus when it comes to that. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The question is not, is Jesus still buried? Because let's be honest, he's not. Praise God, he's alive. But are we still buried in those aspects based on the way that we still want to do it on our own? That we want to fix our marriage, that we want to fix our relationships, that we want to stop our addictions, not change our lives, just, we just want to stop. Are those aspects buried or alive? So the other question might be, if Jesus actually showed up in those areas, Will you be able to recognize him? If Jesus shows up in the situation that you are facing now, will you be able to recognize him? John 14, verse 4 to 7, I want to invite the band to the front. Um, it writes, don't let this rattle you. You trust God, don't you? <laughs> that is the question I want to ask tonight as well. You trust God, don't you? You don't have to answer, but you trust, when, we, when you think about that list, you trust God, don't you? Trust me. There is plenty of room for you in my father's home. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live. And you already know the road that I'm taking. And the conversation goes further. Thomas replies, Master Jesus, we have no idea where you're going. We have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? And Jesus replies, I am the road. And, and it is such a beautiful translation because we always know it as I am the way, the truth, and the life. But when we talk about following Jesus in today's world, that is where we follow him on this road. I am the road, also the truth. And the truth is that Jesus is alive in those situations. Jesus is in front of you, whatever you are facing right now. Also, the life. Where is Jesus now? Where is the Father now in you? 
The Holy Spirit's been poured out for me and for you alive so that we can be in relationship with Him, so that we can follow Him, so that we can go and share the good news for other people. He is life. There is life in the situation where you find yourself now. It is not buried with Jesus and you don't, and don't know what to do. There is life in it because Jesus is in it and He's standing in front of you. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know. You've even seen Him. Can we testify and proclaim tonight that we have seen what God can do? Amen? We have seen what He can do in all situations. What, what makes this different? Can we see the Father and believe the Father in what we're going through right now. So what I'm going to do now is super cheesy and super corny, but it's very important to, to mention. If you find yourself in this in-between phase, you don't know what's going to, ne what's going to happen next or when, it's going to, when there's going to be breakthrough or what you're supposed to be in a situation where you are waiting or you're spiritually preparing for what's next. God made it rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but on day 41, it stopped. Super cheesy? I know, but it's important to hear tonight. Moses committed murder and hid in the desert for 40 years, but in year 41, Jesus called him to release the Israelites in Egypt. Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days, and on day 41, he had the Ten Commandments. Goliath taunted to Israel for 40 days, and on day 41, David came. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and in 40, year 41, they walked into the promised land. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights under temptation in the desert, and in day 41, the devil fled. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples for 40 days. And on day 41, he ascended to heaven, and he poured out the Spirit for me and for you so that we can be alive in him. We have seen His goodness. We have seen what He can do. Can we proclaim tonight that regardless of what's going on, that He's in front of us, He is alive, He is in the situation, and there's nothing that God can't do. Amen? I want to invite you. We're going we're gonna to sing the song again. That we can, can proclaim that there's, no, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. I want to invite you. I trust in my spirit there's something going on in your life that you don't know. You're, you're, you're saying, God, I don't know what to do. I'm trusting for that tonight. Don't just stand and sing this song because it's a good song. It is a good song. But can we stand up and, and proclaim the good news? Can we proclaim the truth that God is alive and there is nothing that He can do regardless of what I am facing? Amen. Thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord. I pray for, for this moment for, for everybody here, Lord. I pray, Lord, for, for the things that they go through, Lord. I pray, Lord, where they focus on that and it becomes bigger than who you are, Lord. I want to, to shift perspective tonight. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will work in each other's hearts tonight, Lord. That you can become the big God who you are, Lord. And the truth of who you are, the life of who you are, so that we can follow on that road to be content, to know the truth, and that uh, we can believe and see you in every situation in our life. Thank you, God, for, for breakthrough, for, for people here tonight. I pray, for Lord, for, for acknowledgement of who you are in their lives, Lord. I pray, Lord, that people will turn to you once again, Lord. Can we proclaim tonight... There's nothing that our God can do, because that is who He is. Amen. Let us stand up and, and let us proclaim this. It's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can
this one way You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one way The darkness has to retreat and Just one touch I feel the presence of me Just one touch, my eyes will open to see. I cannot but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. nothing that you can't do and we just want to praise you and honor you as our Lord and Savior and we want to keep our focus on the cross Lord we want to fix our eyes on what you have done for us that you have been resurrected and that we have been resurrected with you We love you. We praise you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat again. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23 says, 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruits of the Spirit is such a blessing for us to be able to receive. And when we open up our hearts to God and allow Him to come through us, we receive these characteristics and these outflowings that comes from knowing God. And I want to encourage us to not only take this into our daily lives, but how would it look like if we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us with our finances? If we allow Him to give us the peace and the patience that is needed with our finances, and in some instances, the self-control. I want to encourage you to let the Spirit help you and let God be your guide when it comes to your finances. Take this envelope with me and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, I thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit for us, that we are able to receive him and that he is our guide and our counselor. Lord, I ask that you will open up our hearts and our ears, that we will listen to you and what you are saying. And Lord, I pray that you will give us the trust, that we will trust in you, that, you're, that you are enough and that what you know is the best for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope everyone's doing well. So, I don't know if you noticed, um, but there's a couple of different translations in the Bible, and uh, I said patience, but it can also be said as forbearance. And I don't know if anybody has heard the word forbearance before, but I haven't. Um, so, if you're sitting in traffic and you feel you need a bit of patience, and then you think, ah, oh, no, I don't need patience, I need forbearance. And then you think about church, and then you think about Jesus, and then you can smile, everything's good again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you're, and then I also want to welcome everybody again, and if you're new here, or if you're new to the church, and want to find out more about who we are, we are all on a mission here to glorify God and glorify Him together and grow as a community. So if you want to find out more about who we are, We'd love to talk to you there at the back. We have Jock and Cornet if you want to find out more and get involved with us. Also, if you have the, have the need to get in and get involved with the church and the things we are busy doing with, we're all a community here who love God together and serve, serve Him together. So we have this lovely board here that shows where you can get involved. We have small groups on Wednesday evenings, which is a lovely way to grow together with friends and connect with and get, get to know God better. Then, if this ties in also nicely with what Cornet said, if you have the need or the want to hear God's voice in your situations better, um, and if you want to listen to His voice and what He's telling you, it can sometimes be hard to discern if it's your own voice or the world speaking or if it's God speaking. If you want to get to know His voice and how to live out what the Holy Spirit tells you to do um, and how to get involved with God in your life. We have a four-week course leading up to Pentecost, the outflowing of the Holy Spirit, that will show you more about who God is and how to listen to His voice. If, if you want to find out more about that, please come talk to us and we will show you more and give you more, more details. Lastly, um, if there's anything that talked to your heart today, in the sermon or if there's anything going on in your life that you need prayer for or want prayer for if what Kunai said talk with you and if there's something we can pray for you we'd love to the band will be here at the front so please feel free to come we love to pray for you and serve you and we have some amazing coffee and chats we build there at the back all the time after church so please feel free don't walk away. Let's have a good time together and kick off the week on a good note. Thank you, guys.